I would like to start by saying thank you very much for availing yourselves, um, you know, taking the time from your very busy schedules to come and, and really be part of this Human Rights Day um, as, as, as part of uh, Ditsong's um, uh, celebration of Human Rights Day. As you know, it is a very, very important day in the calendar of the Republic of South Africa, um, particularly because this is the time that we, th we, th we, th we, th we think about our nation, um, the people who lost their lives um, in, for, in order for us to gain the freedom that we have today. And also remembering the constitution of the Republic of South Africa that uh, President Mandela signed it uh, on Human Rights Day in Sharpville and uh, we should continue to hold the light on this one. And, and today's topic really is very um, relevant for what's going on in the country today. The challenges that we face of um, um, the coronavirus, the epidemic, uh, or the pandemic, uh, let me say, and also, of course, the gender-based violence uh, that we're experiencing in the country today, just to mention a few. <clears throat> Uh, in the country, we've got the highest uh, unemployment rate. The, the 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 economy for 47 years, it's it's in this state. It has never been in this state for 47 years, according to Stats SA. So we we this is the time that we we really have to come together as a nation, um, in unity and also striving for socioeconomic renewal together and of course uh, with the social cohesion and nation building as the guiding lights for our country. And so today you would have seen that the Minister of Social Development is busy marching. She's uh, part of the march, leading a march on gender-based violence, which is happening as we speak. And so it is critical. And I'm pleased that in the panel, we've got such eminent people um, who will be sharing with us. Dr. Mulebuheng Mohapi, um, is the director of the Ditsong uh, National Museum of Natural History. Um, and also we are joined by Professor Sheena O'Connell, senior lecturer from the Historical and Heritage Studies Department of the University of Pretoria. Um, and also Ms. Bonita Bennett, uh, who's an independent researcher and former director of the District 6 uh, Museum. Um, and also uh, Professor Anton van Follenhoven, I'm not sure whether he's joined us already, uh, archaeologist and heritage consultant, and then last but not least, uh, Professor Matole Mutsecha, who, is, uh, who does not need any introduction, um, a member of parliament, um, the, the chair of the justice committee in parliament, and also founder and executive director of the Kara Heritage Institute. Um, and we're pleased that he was also <clears throat> able to join us uh, this morning. And so without much further ado, um, let me just also indicate the rules of engagement so that when we open it up to the audience, everybody's aware of how we're going to be conducting this. Um, first of all, um, anybody who's got comments and questions, they should be posted on Zoom chat uh, for the panelists to be able to see them and answer sufficiently as we move on with the program. And also to keep the time, uh, we want to keep the time that has been allocated to each one of us in the program. And we also would like to do this so that the audience would have maximum time uh, for the questions that they need answered. Um, and, and also the audience must make their questions clear and concise on Zoom, be very specific and also indicate to whom, out of the panel, to whom are you directing the question uh, so that people would know who is supposed to answer that one. And of course, uh, the audience will be muted. If, if we feel that you are going beyond what needs to, to be, then we will mute you. Um, given the allocated time for, for the questions. So those are the ground rules, uh, colleagues. And uh, I think uh, before um, we can, you know, since we've lost some time, 
uh, earlier on, let me just get into the nuts and bolts of the discussion. Um, so everybody must feel welcome to this discussion. We are free, it's Human Rights Day. And uh, the purpose really is for us to dialogue on the, on the, on the topics that are interrelated, unity, social cohesion, socioeconomic renewal, and nation building. How can we build a stronger nation together as South Africans? Um, so Dr. Mohapi, um, without much further ado, uh, you've got uh, 10 minutes from now on um, um, to just um, make your remarks and, uh, and input. Um, and then that will be followed by the questions, um, answers and comments from the audience. We'll give the audience the opportunity. So if you can help uh, Dr. Mohapi and kick off the discussion. Good morning, colleagues. Um, Dr. Matoma, I feel starstruck because I'm, I'm, I'm in the panel with people I've looked up to as, as a young student of history and later on as a young student of, of archaeology. And here I am in the same panel. So excuse me if I, I feel a, a bit um, jittery because I'm really starstruck and I mean, I mean, I'm just in awe of, of the panel. Uh, let me start by <clears throat> getting into definitions because, you know, sometimes when we talk about certain topics or certain um, issues which are usually uh, you know, discussed casually, we never really talk about what exactly do they mean. And yet we know that words mean different things when used in different contexts. The topic says, how can museums and other heritage institutions contribute to unity, to socioeconomic renewal, social cohesion, and nation building? So I looked, I looked uh, at definitions of these um, words, the words that we, we are interested in. I looked at the definition of unity in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. And uh, unity is defined as the quality or state of not being multiple. That is the state of oneness. Social cohesion can be described as the glue that bonds society together to achieve harmony, a sense of community, and to achieve common good. And this is a definition I got from the World Bank and it was, um, this definition was developed in 2001 by the World Bank. Some people define social cohesion as the willingness of members of society to cooperate in order to survive and to prosper. The definition of nation building, I chose, the, there are many definitions of nation building. I chose the one that the Department of Sports, Arts and Culture have put on their website it, they describe nation building as the process whereby a society of people with diverse origins, histories, languages, cultures, and religions come together within the boundaries of a sovereign state with a unified constitutional and legal dispensation, a national public education system, an integrated national economy, shared symbols and values as equals to work towards eradicating the divisions and injustices, injustices of the past. I won't go further because it's a very long definition of nation building, but I thought it encapsulated a whole lot of uh, what nation building is all about. And I thought to myself, there's probably no uh, definition of social economic renewal but I thought to myself, so what, what do I understand this word to mean, social economic renewal? I believe we are talking of renewal from a year of the pandemic, a year of a recession stemming from an economy brought to a standstill by the pandemic. Particularly people who were affected by this pandemic more than anybody else are probably art, culture, and heritage practitioners. They were most hard hit because large gatherings were prohibited. And we know that art, culture, and heritage practitioners 
do their work mostly in large gatherings. So we're talking of renewal from a year of the pandemic, a year that has resulted in many people losing their jobs, in many households really struggling to make ends meet. And um, what I also noticed as I was reading on these topics is that it appears that terms such as social cohesion and nation building are often applied in societies where the strings that attach people together would have been cut or broken by certain events. We look at uh, events such as wars, your world wars, which broke the fiber of society and divided people. We look at issues such as uh, colonialism, which divided people. In our case, apartheid, whose basis uh, was the separation of people based on skin color. And it would appear that states or governors would find it uh, important to think of uh, using these terms or to put attention on these terms to your social cohesion, unity, nation building, because they want to build a society or a community that was um, separated by some sort of event or some sort of happening in the past. So uh, I also looked at what, what are museums? I, I won't even get into the definitions of what museums are, but I want to look at what the mandate, the mandate of museums is. Museums are established uh, through the Cultural Institutions Act of 1998. And so the topic, the topic that we're dealing with today is in line with the mandate given to museums and other cultural institutions by the Act. Because uh, the Act indicates that museums are responsible for policy formulation. Museums are responsible to hold, preserve, and safeguard all movable and immovable property of whatever kind placed in the care of or loaned or belonging to the declared institution. Museums are responsible to receive, hold, preserve, and safeguard all specimens, collections, or other movable property placed under its care and management. We are, museums are also uh, responsible to raise funds for the institutions. Colleagues, I'm focusing mostly on museums because I'm a museum uh, person. Um, I think other colleagues who work in other heritage institutions will probably chip in with what the role of other heritage institutions are. But according to the act, we are supposed to raise funds for the institution and we are supposed to manage and control the monies received and to utilize those monies in expenses connected to the performance of our functions as institutions. And we are supposed to keep a proper record of the property of the declared institution to submit to the director general any returns required by him or, or, it, or her in regard thereto and to cause proper books of account to be kept. I also wanted to look at what are other responsibilities allocated to museums by the medium term strategic framework. In this case, we're looking at the 2019-2025 MTSF. There are five priorities which are really relevant to the role of museums in, in society. The first one is a capable ethical and developmental state. The second priority is economic transformation and job creation, which uh, in the past was not necessarily regarded one of the responsibilities of museums, but we know that each and every member of society right now is entrusted with job creation because as Dr. Matoma indicated earlier, we live in a very, um, we live in a, a society with high levels of unemployment. The other priority that is relevant to the work of museums is education, skills, and health. Museums are um, knowledge hubs. Museums are places where research is conducted on various topics. We also are responsible for social cohesion and safer communities. That is uh, what we are responsible for, to contribute to social cohesion and safer communities. 
I then asked myself after looking at these um, responsibilities uh, or the mandate that is uh, that museums are entrusted with, I then wanted to, to I asked myself, so what are ways in which museums can contribute to unity now that now that I know what unity means to social cohesion, to nation building and so, social economic renewal? I think museums have the advantage of being public spaces with access to various groups of people and therefore have the power to create unity on a social and political level. Museums are spaces for intercultural dialogue and are spaces where all members of society should feel represented. Museums should therefore ensure inclusivity of all members of society in their collections, in uh, our displays or exhibitions and in our narratives. Our narratives should represent all members of society, particularly those who had a, who, who had some sort of influence in the spaces that we work in. It's important for people to feel included because then they know that they matter. If people don't feel represented or feel included in whatever that we are doing, they do not feel that they matter. Museums therefore have to transform their spaces in cases where certain groups of society are excluded. We recently, or not recently, that not that recent because it was some time last year, we had an internal research seminar as um, at Digital Museum of South Africa. And one of the presenters, I think she's in the audience, um, Gertrude Mozani, she indicates she um, presented research that she did at one of our site museums called Semimax Museum. And in her presentation, she indicated that she feels that the employees or the black employees of Semimax who lived on the farm for decades and helped to build his legacy were excluded in the narrative that we gave to the public. Because of that, we are now as, a muse as, as, as an institution looking at uh, our narrative and looking at whether our narrative, our exhibitions or displays and um, our collections are representative of, of all members of society. And the plan is to change that. If there are members of society of, or of the community who are excluded by our narrative, we want to change that um, situation. I worked at Robben Island Museum, and uh, I know that the museum is busy implementing what is called the Memorialization Project. Uh, and this project seeks to revise the island's narrative from being too Mandela-rised, because when I was there, when before this project started, the island was accused of being too Mandela-rised. Everything was all about Mandela. Uh, and the role that Mandela played. While that is important, it, it meant that other members of society or groups of people who had a footprint on the island felt excluded because their narratives were not uh, told in detail in the way that we told the narrative or in the way that we told the history of Mandela on the island. And that is what I mean by museums having that advantage to include everyone in, the, in their narrative, in their displays and exhibitions, uh, in their collections. Because when, feel, when people feel included, they feel like a part of, of the whole and they buy into the idea of unity. They become uh, united. That is the advantage that museums have. And I don't think as museums, we understand how much um, how much access we have to people. We have access to a lot of people. We have access to schools. We have access to, and you know, it's, it's so important to start some of these um, um, corrections of inclusivity when people, children are still young. They grow up not seeing color. They grow up not seeing class. They grow up understanding that we are all one people. The second way in which I think museums can contribute to unity, social cohesion, nation building, and socioeconomic renewal is through museums have access to the past and should use the past to educate the public about issues which separated 
communities in the past. We know what separated communities in the past, whether in this country or anywhere in the world. We know that uh, what led to, um, to the Holocaust of the Jews in Germany, uh, we know what caused it. Uh, we know what caused the Holocaust in, in Rwanda, we know what caused apartheid or uh, what were the results of apartheid. We have that insight into the past and we should use that uh, past to educate the public about issues which separated communities. Museums are agents of socioeconomic change. This can, change can be achieved through tackling topical issues through our public programs, especially because we have insight into the past and can give perspective or provide the history of causes of some societal problems. Museums shouldn't shy away from having difficult discussions on topics such as race relations, on, on land redistribution, gender-based violence, environmental issues. We have to lead those discussions on difficult topics that can help us to be a united um, people. I, if I were to take the example of racial uh, relations, I always feel that racial relations in this country are shied away from uh, people don't want to talk about race relations. And when you start talking about race relations, people become very uncomfortable. But unfortunately, if we do not have these discussions, there will be certain um, things that continue to happen because we are not addressing them. Uh, I, I, I always say, if we do not, I, at, 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 the, at the time that we got independence or that uh, in 1994, the main focus, in my opinion, was on building reconciliation because we, we were such a, um, a divided community or society. And I think at the time, we did not discuss issues, certain issues. We, we sugarcoated or we tiptoed around certain issues that divided us because we didn't want to get into, um, into the details and hopefully, or I think at the time, the, the idea was that that would separate communities further. But what we forgot is that when issues or the cause of divisions are not addressed, they sit in some corner in each one of us and they grow into what I always call pass. They become like pass. You know, when you have pass and it's, uh, you are not addressing this pass, at one point it just bursts and when it bursts, it doesn't burst in a pattern. It just scatters all over because you've not been addressing uh, this issue. And I believe uh, in, 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 in the case, for instance, of race relations, museums should lead some of these discussions. Oh no, my time is up. Public engagement. I think that public programs should seek to engage the public in, in, in our programs. For instance, at the Museums of South Africa, we have a program that we call co-create and co-curate program where the, we give the public the opportunity to contribute to our public programs. It is meant to attract people who are not primarily museum visitors through captivating museum uh, programs, while at the same time providing job opportunities for art and cultural practitioners. I won't get into some of the programs that we do in that. Uh, but I also think museums, I'm, I'm wrapping up Dr. Matoma. Yes, um, yes, yes. I also think that museums uh, need to, uh, income, to, to, to get into income diversification through a range of other non-museum programs. Because we know that we are not going to get any more funds from government. Now I'm addressing the issue of uh, socioeconomic renewal. We Thank know that we're not uh, getting uh, any more funds Dr. from Mahathis. government. Dr. Yes, Dr. Thank you very uh, much. I, I would like you to take note of that because when we come to the question time, you would still yes. be able to, to touch on the things that you were not able to. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Thank you very much for finish. such a wonderful presentation. <laughs> Let me open it up now. Uh, we've got about, what, five minutes for questions. Uh, let me just indicate we've got Tebucho, uh, Pizzo, Terence Mkonza, and also Yakus Kwonrad. 
from GMSA who are also assisting us in this uh, uh, process. So thank you very much for that. Um, so, so let's open it up. It's now, according to my watch, uh, 10.38. So let's open it up for uh, questions uh, from members of the audience. I, I don't know uh, if there are any, I can see. No, I don't think, uh, I don't see any questions on the, on the group chat here. Uh, but if let's open it up, if there are any people, if, if there's anybody who wants to. Um, oh, okay, there's a, there's a comment from Yako to everyone. Um, and it says, thank you, Dr. Mohapi, for touching on the narrative that we should change in order to include all cultures and people's stories. GMSA's head office is in the former uh, past office, there was once a project whereby people who were affected by the past laws were interviewed, and that served as an oral history, as oral history being recorded, but as well as their narrative that were told. Objects were also collected. The next step would also be to interview people who worked in the old past office. That would bring both uh, sides of the narrative. Uh, thank you, Yako, for, for, for raising that issue. I think uh, it's uh, the part of the museum, the head office, which is called Hamutle. I think so. Uh, you will correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and, okay. and you know how that's the past that uh, Dr. Mohapi was referring to. Um, so, so, so the past loss and the impact it had, and now we have a democratic South Africa, we all have equal rights, but it's part of the past that we should not forget. And uh, it's one of the roles of the museum's access to the past. And I also want, want to thank you, Dr. Mahapi, for starting with the definitions uh, so that we can all move from the same level. Um, because as they say in Afrikaans, the Ian man se duot as the other man se bruot, or, or one man se, freedom fighter is another man's uh, terrorist, you know? So if we define the terms, then we're all moving from the same uh, standpoint. Um, I don't know if there's anything. Yako, I see you up there. Is there anything you wanted to say? Uh, thank you, Dr. Pandalani. Uh, no, I think I, I, I covered in uh, my whole thing in the chat, but um, yeah, I think it would be wonderful to maybe uh, get people to, to interview people who worked at an institution like that um, to, to hear the side of the story and even what they saw happening, you know, and um, it would bring uh, also a balance to, uh, to the narrative. And it would be very interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. It, it, it most definitely, especially as part of oral history, uh, the people are not gonna be around forever, you know? So, so there's the agency of the moment that those who are still alive, who worked in that office, if we can be able to trace them and be able to interview them, that would be a great wealth of knowledge that we would have, which would be accessible to, you know, to, to the future. Okay, um, Gertrude, um, Dr. Mahapi mentioned the um, semi marks. Is there any comment you wanted to add on what she said? Gertrude Mutsane, maybe she stepped out. Um, but in the meantime, I think um, in the absence of further questions, let's move on. Um, we will still save some more time for more questions later. Um, Professor Sheena O'Connell, uh, from the University of Pretoria, um, the Historical Heritage and Studies Department. Uh, Sheena, are you ready for your own um, presentation and input? I am, thank you very much. And I will, um, great, thank you very much. May I go ahead? Yes. Thank you, Dr. Matoma, Dr. Mahapi, and thank you, Ditsong, for hosting this event. I am in illustrious company. I admit to having been ambivalent about museums unsure of what I was precisely meant to do and feel during and after a visit. I've been fortunate in that I have visited scores of them here in South Africa as well as abroad. 
regardless of the location, I always leave with a set of lingering questions. Am I looking at something or am I looking for something in the museum? In looking at exhibits, if I'm lucky, I find an elusive glimpse of my story, identifying with it in very small measures. This is fleeting and it far too often blurs into the generic experience of a museum visit. Am I transformed by my visit? And I'm left wondering if I should be. Interpreting the present as a moment of challenge and reflection, museums in South Africa are well placed to respond to recent and not so recent events that have, that have unfolded in the country, the reverberations of which continue to be felt on all possible levels. Taking the challenges of a shifting and uneasy landscape due to the COVID-19 pandemic, gender-based violence, climate change, as well as the ongoing protests around poverty and privilege, museums now have the chance and the challenge to place these events and the effects in a comparative perspective, introducing fresh thinking about unity and freedom in South Africa through the interplay of representation, memory and justice. I believe the most pressing challenge in South Africa right now is economic disparity, which demands a closely focused lens on race, history, privilege, and power. The fault lines that are so cruelly and violently exposed in South Africa, among these being deepening inequality, contested histories, displacement, and unbelonging, offers those of us committed to the project of freedom, the chance to tease apart the ongoing impacts of apartheid. It urges a reckoning with our failure to fully consider the effects of an equally important, deeper and complex layer of its historic entanglement, namely that of slavery in the Cape and its subsequent threads in the South African fabric. It is urgent and timely to address this unfinished business, which continues to impact negatively on, amongst others, processes of transformation and inclusive citizens, citizenry and the decolonization of learning and ways of being. And it is in this milieu that South African museums can play its role towards the long overdue actualization of freedom in a country as diverse and complex as ours. How does the museum define and make sense of polarities, those of the oppressed in the past and those of spectators in the present? If so, how does this positioning assimilate larger questions of trauma, memory, and citizenship? The notion of citizen is strongly linked to the idea of rights, such as, the, such as the right to vote in a place, but we use it loosely without thinking thoroughly through of the implications. The process of belonging, of unity, and citizenship, and citizenship involve both public and private narratives and concrete experiences of ordinary life that often do not cohere. Yet, imagining citizenship within the space of the museum provides important definitional frames for the ways people see themselves as public when they do. Who is the benchmark citizen in post-apartheid South Africa? What are the practices museums need to deploy that underscore that citizenship is not organic, but must be acquired through public and psychic participation participation. The business of citizenship and unity is an ambiguous process vulnerable to changes in government and policy. The, the citizen and its vehicle, citizenship, are unstable sites that mutually interact to forge local, often changing notions of who the citizen is and the kinds of citizenship possible at a given historical moment. How do notions of community and citizenship and unity fit into the larger framework of South Africa's history of unbelonging, dispossession, and displacement? How does it engage with the fraught issues of representing the unrepresentable in a way that speaks of the now? What is the situation of memory and, muse and museums within larger discussions of unity? Is there not a politics of remembering and forgetting that is tied up with questions of power and citizenship? Paul Connaughton in his seminal work, How Societies Remember, reminds us what we remember and forget is of, is of pivotal importance when constructing political, national, and other identities. Identities are developed, constructed, and diminished through a series of myths, selection of memories, and personalities. As Jan Werner Muller argues, 
whenever national identity seems to be in question, memory comes to be a key to national recovery through reconfiguring the past. The relationship therefore between those in power and what they choose to remember is crucial. The public museum as an enlistment of culture for the purposes of governing, according to Tony Bennett, acquired its modern form during the late 18th and 19th centuries. Museums as cultural symbols of governments and citizenship ensured that the role afforded to their principal spectators was precisely that, excluded and external. This was a place where, according to Bennett, behaviors could be aspired to and learned. It was significantly more than a place of wonder and surprise for the idly curious. Existing literature continues to tease apart the dilemmas of contemporary museums around the world. They sketch the contested world of morphing social relations and have resulted in no small part in many institutions considering new avenues and new knowledges, a remapping of the museum, if you will. These shifts, the conflicts and tensions, the frictions between the global and the local, the admissions of new audiences, the demise of the old, pose particular challenges for some museums, which appear to be struggling to make meaningful headway in articulating a new ethical order. As public institutions, museums have always been, according to Daniel Sherman, sites for the negotiation of difference, a space where the self cannot exist without the other, a relationship that sits at the heart of the institution. I argue that it is this relationship that holds promise. Museums are well positioned to get into the entanglement around power structures and dynamics in South Africa, making the argument that to understand South Africa and who belongs and who doesn't, need structures and their histories to be understood as a form of deep inscription manifested in overt and covert ways, in architecture, collections, institutional rights, rituals and networks amongst others. Entanglements, for instance, about making sense of the presence with a wide interdisciplinary grip relating cultures, social forces, and social institutions and social conflicts. Entanglements serve special analytical uses because they presuppose connecting points, weaves and particular relations of power that also require disentanglement in the interpretive process. More important is that entanglements presuppose processes of emergence and the consequences and the interrelations. I suggest that museums invest in aims and programs that use collaborative, creative and interdisciplinary approaches in order to gain more understanding of how multiple histories may, may shape the interests of unity and freedom and those that resonate with the lived experience of contemporary South Africans across all spheres. The opportunity to produce, to produce bold and creative work on the difficult yet necessary questions that are holding South Africa to ransom afford South African museums and their publics an opportunity, an opportunity to work in an interdisciplinary fashion that will have far reaching effects. In other words, museums are never simply pre-given but are always sites of meaning that are future orientated. It is less about the past than the present and the future. This approach underpins the project of freedom and the project of unity in the sense that it suggests that ongoing construction of knowledge about South Africa's entanglement with the historical trauma of the past provides a starting point for action rather than an endpoint. As such, they speak to an embracing set of issues concerning the future and the meaning of the museum as an institution and its place in society globally. For South African museums, the focus on multiple histories and understanding that the current situation in this country is as a result of factors particular and peculiar in a post-apartheid, post-colonial South Africa will allow for an addressing of the issues currently impeding the project of unity. By working collaboratively and fostering partnerships, museums can take their central place in facilitating dialogue between multiple publics in South Africa. These include constituents who are attempting to confront this legacy of slavery, colonialism and racism and allow us all to see more clearly shared or similar structural impediments and respond to them in ways already shown to work. Museums will, in effect, be in the business of constant acts of reading, responding, revision, and interpretation. To do this, we need to ask, what imaginative me methods can we employ 
to learn more to expand our knowledge of our past. How do we work with difficult and complex heritage without allowing it to disenable important, important and leg legitimate work in the present or to foreclose on important discussions about the past? How can commemorations, historical and contemporary, create deeper reflection, deeper reflection upon inequality and institutional violence in our society on questions of memory and, citizen, and citizenship, as well as the leadership role of the museum towards the project of transformation and unity. I believe absolutely that we need to invest in the skills of all per museum personnel, driving home that symbols, artifacts, and their representation have meanings beyond the immediate display as they require active engagement between object and the recipient. We need to be brave and ask the difficult and unsettling questions that continue to trouble our present. We need to provide a critical platform for recognition of other neglected heretic practices, the intangible, the forgotten and the peripheral to generate dialogue around such issues, the values of which can be realized and sustained towards the collaborative and co collective efforts of academics and student groups community organizations and religious and social justice groups. Museums who are up to the challenge can illuminate and address structural impediments in South Africa in order to effect the change that their publics continue to seek. Through a dynamic approach, museums can develop, develop emergent and novel ideas and strengthen capacity around ideas of its historical and legacies and accountability that will shape the question of unity and belonging of all in, in this country. It is a unity that is long overdue and that we all deserve. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Professor O'Connell. And, and thank you for reminding us about uh, such important things. Um, and when you're speaking about the dilemmas of the contemporary museums, I, 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 I was thinking about the kinds of issues that museums are facing in the world uh, today. Um, and, and also the issues of entanglement and disentanglement um, and, and the, the various projects as well, Project Freedom, Project Unity, and, and basically how all of them can contribute. I was thinking about not just about our own museums, but uh, museums all around the world, um, whether, whether it's the Ahmed Baba uh, Institute Museum in Timbuktu, whether it's the Louvre in, in Paris, or the Imperial War Museum in London, um, you know, or the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh, uh, museums all over the world. So our museums are not really facing unique issues, you know, challenges. Uh, the rise of nationalism in Europe, for instance, and the United States, uh, it's, another, it's another issue with regard to, to unity, the dilemmas that they're all facing. So thank you for that. Let's, I'm going to suggest that we, we take the set of questions for Professor O'Connell, and then we will then um, take a five minute break um, and then come back. I'll give you the time uh, so that we can stretch our legs. We've, we would have had the two presentations and we have two more presentations left um, that we, we will be looking at. Um, and so is there, is there anybody Nate, are you trying to share the screen with us? I see uh, Twala is trying to share the screen with us. Okay, can we, can we then do take the questions um, for us uh, for the next five minutes? Uh, so it's actually 10.57 uh, by 11.02, we can then be breaking uh, for, for the, for, for, for just for the five minute stretch break. Um, are there any, any questions? Tebu or Terence, are there any questions that you're following up? I don't see anything on the chat box. Yako, is there anything that you've noticed? Uh, nothing from Nothing, nothing from, from your side, ne? Um, I, uh, no queries at the moment. No queries at the moment, ne? No, I've raised my hand. Who, who's raised the hand? Is that get oh get so yes. who, who who raised the hand? I, I can't see the hand. It's get root. Oh get root, yes. 
Mutsane, how, how are you? I'm good on yourself, Dr. Matam. I'm good, thank you. Please uh, go ahead. Uh, this is not a question, but rather a comment uh, and to just echo what uh, Professor O'Connell and Dr. Um, Mohapi alluded to in that uh, I believe we, we need to move from viewing, especially museums as places of objects, but rather that they are spaces of people. So we need to, to deal with societal and um, issues that um, face people rather than uh, objects first and then the people first. So the, the object are just a link to uh, these people. So museums are, are definitely an apt a space to deal with such issues. They were installed on um, principles of segregation and oppression, and we are a perfect space to can redress those injustices of the past and uh, so that we can move towards a unified society. It's important to deal with the issues that led us to where we are now before we can move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gertrude. That's a very good intervention. Um, actually, the one comment I can add to what you were just saying, and this is the point that uh, both Dr. Mohapi and, and Professor O'Connell made um, about this issue about objects. The objects are there. It's about linking the past uh, to the future, to the present, and, and hopefully to the future. But what are we doing? You know, what is the past teaching us uh, about, about, so the objects are there as, a, as, as um, objective evidence of, of what we're trying to do. For instance, I'll give you an example. Um, when we went, when I was still working for government and we accompanied President Tawambeki to Timbuktu um, and we went into the Ahmed Baba, um, you know, library, the institute there. And President Beke, as you know, was talking about the African Renaissance. And when he saw the, the manuscript in Timbuktu, he actually was very impressed because the manuscripts were now, the objects of the manuscripts were now talking to uh, his African Renaissance theme, which, which, which is, uh, you know, it gave a practical evidence to what he's been talking about, that there has been knowledge in Africa before colonization. And so, which led to a project where South Africa helped Mali to digitalize all the manuscripts uh, so that they can be accessible to everybody. And, and that's what anybody who goes to Timbuktu today will be able to find. But it came from that uh, perspective. So they link us with the present and what we're trying to do, but also to understand our past, where we're coming from. Is there any other input um, from the chat? I don't see anything. Um, I can see from the audience, um, we have time for one more input. If, if there is not, then we will break. Is there anyone who wants to come in? And as, as a democratic chair or, or as a benevolent chair, I will be pointing to members of the audience as well. Ne? Uh, just get ready, Matodi, I saw you, you are there. I saw uh, uh, Nelson Zwane is also part of the audience. I saw Selena is there, Tukelo. I will be coming to you. Uh, Dr. Miriam Tawane is also on the audience, in the audience there. So I'll be coming to you colleagues uh, in the next uh, presentations. 